All right, folks, brace yourselves because this one's a doozy. A Colorado judge has a foot in both worlds in arguably the single most important constitutional case in modern U.S. history. On the one hand, this judge declared that Donald Trump is legally and literally an insurrectionist. But on the other hand, that same judge also ordered the Secretary of State to keep Donald Trump's name on the 2024 ballot. But before we unpack all that, if you haven't yet, please hit that like, subscribe, and the alert bell. Okay, folks, this, there's some good news here, there's some bad news here. It's a mixed bag. It's very frustrating. Here's the situation. You may recall that there have been several lawsuits in several states, and likely to be several more, challenging Donald Trump's eligibility to hold public office. The logic is that when Donald Trump was president, he violated Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. We'll look at that in just a second, which essentially disqualifies anybody from ever holding public office if they've engaged in an insurrection. Okay, that's the purpose of these lawsuits, and there's one in Colorado which was recently decided. We'll get into that, but here's the language of the 14th, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. No person shall be a senator or representative in Congress or elector of president and vice president or hold any office, civil or military, under the United States or under any state who, having previously taken an oath as a member of Congress or as an officer of the United States or as a member of any state legislature or as an executive or judicial officer of any state, to support the Constitution of the United States shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same or given aid and comfort to the enemies thereof. But Congress may, by a vote of two-thirds of each House, remove such a disability. So Section 3 of the 14th Amendment was one of the many post-Civil War Reconstruction era uh, amendments to the Constitution in which the victorious Union wanted to disqualify the key members. Uh, I shouldn't say key members because it was just officers as well. It wasn't just Jefferson Davis and people like that. But basically people who had sworn an oath to the Constitution and violated it by you know, engaging in secession, helping the Confederacy – the union wanted to keep these people out of office. They were like, you had your shot. You betrayed the Constitution. You can still vote. You're still a citizen of the United States, but you can't be trusted in a leadership role, so you are disqualified from public office. That's the logic behind it. Now, nothing about that language landlocks it or time locks it to just the Civil War. Okay, It doesn't say just the Civil War. It talks about insurrection. So those were the key questions over – this particular case in Colorado, did Donald Trump engage in insurrection, and is he disqualified as a result of holding public office ahead of the 2024 election? I'll also remind you that the people who brought this lawsuit were not Democrats. They were Republican and undeclared voters. Okay, so with that in mind, I want to play this clip, and we'll unpack it together. We're all trying to make sense of this, but joining me now is someone who can help us do that, Colorado Secretary of State Jenna Griswold. Well, Secretary Griswold, thank you so much for joining us. I've been trying to, I've been reading all the clips and I've been trying to make sense of what this all means. So let me start by just asking you what your reaction is to the ruling and what this means in Colorado. Well, I think first off, having the court say that the former president engaged in insurrection is big news for the entire country. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump is a danger to American democracy, and, and that's something that's really novel about that, this case, that the judge decided that. Uh, but ultimately, she has ordered me to put him on the ballot, uh, and I will, of course, follow whatever court order is in place by the time I certify the ballot. The judge found and this is what's so interesting because it does it is significant. I'm not a lawyer, but that the judge did say he was involved in the instruction, as you just said. The judge also found that Trump as president was not an officer of the United States. Uh, did, did that surprise you? Honestly, yes. The idea that if you're a soldier or a Congress person, a U.S. senator, that if you engage in insurrection, you can't be qualified to sit in office again. But the U.S. president can engage in insurrection and then be president, president again, uh, I think is a, a, a potentially dangerous precedent. Uh, the presidency is the most powerful office in this nation. And that I, the idea that the U.S. Constitution does not protect uh, against a, a rogue insurrectionist president uh, I think is um, a, a big concept. And, and honestly, it's not just a big concept. It doesn't make any sense on its face whatsoever. Now, I'm not a legal scholar either. I own that. OK, but the idea the the history of the Section 3 of the 14th Amendment wasn't merely to punish people who engaged in insurrection. Of course, that was part of it. There was a punitive element. It was also threat 
prevention. The idea was you wielded considerable public trust and power. You betrayed that. You can't be trusted to hold public office again, right? Because if it was just about punishment, we would have just clapped him in irons, thrown him in jail, right? It wasn't just punishment. It was also threat prevention. So let's think about this. How is it that we can find soldiers who took a constitutional oath and betrayed it dangerous or senators or congress people or whomever else people of posi in positions of power and trust they are dangerous if they betrayed that oath so we can't trust them to uphold that oath again but if you hold the single most powerful office in this country by far as we've discussed and there's so many ways there is no office that is imbued with such power like the presidency the presidency is effectively a branch of government unto itself. How is it that we can trust that? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Now, we're not going to read the whole thing. It's a 102-page it's a legal briefing, but I took some notes here because what's interesting is um, – and, and I actually do want to look at some of this. So the court qualified – so we're going to read some excerpts here, which I find really important in terms of addressing some of the arguments made by Trumpers, okay? So uh, the judge says the court qualified Professor Banks as an expert on the president's powers to stop domestic attacks on the government and the authorities that then President Trump had to stop the attack on January 6th. The court finds that Professor Banks's testimony was credible and helpful to understand the authority that then President Trump had over the D.C. National Guard, as well as any authority he had over the National Guard of the adjoining states. The court gave weight to Professor Banks's testimony in finding that Trump had the authority to call in reinforcements on January 6, 2021, and chose not to exercise it, thereby recklessly endangering the lives of law enforcement, Congress, and others uh, on January 6. It's important because a lot of people like to pretend that it was actually Nancy Pelosi who had the security responsibility on January 6, and Donald Trump's hands were tied. That's just not true. Donald Trump had ultimate law enforcement, uh, not only authority, but an affirmative duty to do something about it. And he failed to do so. And this is one of the re arguments that the petitioners were making in the court case. Uh, in paragraph 100, uh, Trump put forth no evidence at the hearing that he believed his claims of voter fraud despite the overwhelming evidence there was none. This is important. The court finds that Trump knew his claims of voter fraud were false. And by the way, this is something that Jack Smith and others can make use of um, in the special counsel trials in D.C. and in Florida. Um, the, because what when court cases like these are decided, they are fodder for other concurrent court cases as well. So the fact that a court of law has found that Donald Trump knew his claims of voter fraud were false is materially relevant. I skipped some other parts here, some other notes that I made. Um, like this one goes back again to uh, Donald Trump's authorities. The court finds that Trump, as commander of the D.C. National Guard, had law enforcement entities at his disposal to help stop the attack without any further approval. He didn't need Nancy Pelosi's approval. He didn't need the D.C. mayor's approval. He had more authority by far than any of them, and he could have said, listen, I'm doing whatever I have to to stop the insurrection. He chose not to. He could have redeployed the 340 National Guard troops already activated in D.C., um, there's no evidence that he made any effort on January 6th to redeploy these troops. Um, he could have ordered the deployment of additional D.C. National Guard troops. He could have asked the governors of Maryland and Virginia to authorize their state National Guards. He could have also federalized them because the, the president has that authority. He could have ordered the Department of Justice rapid response teams to the Capitol. He could have authorized the Department of Homeland Security's rapid response team, which could have deployed in a matter of minutes from headquarters to the Capitol. The court finds that Trump had the authority to call in reinforcements and chose not to. Again, just a damning dereliction of duty. There's more to it here. Sorry, again, 102 pages. Um, let's see here. So this is a, another one. This is even bigger still. The court concludes that the events on and around January 6, 2021, easily satisfy the definition of insurrection. So when people ask, well, is January 6th an insurrection? Uh, as far as the court's concerned, yes, that's a matter of fact, and anyone who says otherwise is a liar. The mob's purpose was to prevent the execution of the Constitution so that Trump remained president. Specifically, the mob sought to obstruct the counting of electoral votes, as was set out in the 12th Amendment, and thereby prevent the peaceful transfer of power. It was indeed an insurrection. Uh, let's see. Having considered the arguments, the court concludes that engagement under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment includes incitement to insurrection. This gets to their conclusion that Donald Trump is indeed an insurrectionist, okay, because incitement – as far as the court is concerned, counts as an element of engagement. By merely inciting, you have engaged, okay? Um, let's see here. 
and this is part of their logic. Lastly, it would be anomalous to exclude those insurrectionists or rebels who have taken an oath, participated in the insurrection or rebellion through instigation or incitement, okay? Instigation and incitement are typically actions taken by those in leadership roles and not, for example, by those on the front lines with weapon in hand. To exclude from disqualification such people would seem to defeat the purpose of disqualification, at, at least as it relates to potential leaders of insurrection. So again, the idea that the framers of the 14th Amendment would want to exclude the people, the, the foot soldiers, the lackeys, the thugs, the grunts, be it in the Civil War or any other insurrection. Those people can't hold office, but the Jefferson Davises and, and the masterminds behind the Civil War, or indeed in this case Donald Trump, that they would somehow not be included. That makes absolutely no sense what, whatsoever because they're more important, they're more dangerous, uh, and the court finds that accordingly. But ultimately, um, I want to get to the part here where, let's see, it says it specifically down here at some point. Um, okay, paragraph 298. Consequently, the court finds that petitioners have established that Donald Trump engaged in insurrection on January 6th through incitement and that the First Amendment does not protect Donald Trump's speech. Again, part of the rationale was um, – the Trump's attorneys made the case that, listen, people use strong incendiary political rhetoric all the time. But as the court says, this argument, however, ignores both the significant history of Trump's relationship to political violence and the noted escalation in Trump's rhetoric in the lead up to and on January 6, 2021. It further disregards the distinct atmosphere of threats and calls for violence existing around the 2020 election and its legitimacy. When interpreting Trump's language, the court must consider not only the content of his speech, but the form and context of as well, because so many Trump apologists say, well, listen, Trump said at one point or another, hey, go be peaceful. Well, if you cherry pick just those instances, sure, but the court's not obligated to do that. Indeed, the court has an obligation to consider not just the content, but the full context and Trump's rich history of employing violent political rhetoric. Those two, one or two, you know, disclaimers, which are vastly outweighed by the, the bulk of his violent rhetoric, they don't save him. And the court was right to make that decision. Now, this is where the bad news sits in, okay? So they had a constitutional scholar come in and listen. The, the Professor Magliocca provided historical evidence that the presidency was understood as an office, civil, or military under the United States, uh, such that disqualified individuals could not assume the presidency. The most compelling testimony to that effect was exchanged by Reconstruction-era Senators Morrill and Johnson during the congressional debates, where one senator explained to the other that the presidency was covered by office, civil, or military under the United States, okay? He also also testified this expert that it would be preposterous that Section 3 would not cover Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, should he have wished to run for president of the United States after the Civil War. Okay, So even senators at the time when a, the, the president and vice president were not specifically mentioned, they were like, listen, that, that counts as any officer under the United States. The professor also testified that during Reconstruction, the president of the United States was understood to be an officer of the United States. Okay. In other words, Magliocca testified because the presidency is an office, any person who holds that office and swears an oath was understood to be an officer. Stansbury's second opinion letter goes on to say that the president is an executive officer, okay? Kind of like how the CEO, the chief executive officer of a company, is indeed a corporate officer, even if he's the highest level one, okay? Um, Magliocca further argued that contemporary usage of that term at the time, that the president is an officer of the United States, Andrew Johnson repeatedly referred to himself as in presidential proclamations, members of Congress, both during and the 39th Congress, which ratified the 14th Amendment, and during Johnson's impeachment several years later, repeatedly referred to the president the same way, okay? So there is indeed ample evidence that the presidency was considered just an office under the United States, even again if it was the most powerful. But there was some evidence to the contrary, okay? But here's where it gets really aggravating. The judge is splitting hairs. So, okay, in this context, yes, the presidency is considered – here are some compelling reasons as to why that was the case. But in other instances, the presidency was considered separately, that it was considered a separate office, okay? So there's a mixed bag. And then she gets into the weeds in terms of the oath. She says, listen, Section 3 specifies that the disqualifying oath is one to support the Constitution, whereas the presidential oath is to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. So that's part of the basis by which the judge is making these distinctions. Well, listen, you know, the 14th Amendment talks about um, to, you know, oaths to support the Constitution of the United States, to support, to support, to support. The president takes an oath not to support but to preserve, protect, and defend. 
which sure sounds like support to me. Those are three different words to you know that are synonyms to uh, support. But this is like the the overly rigid textual basis by which she's couching her opinion. And that's why she concludes as a result, section three, as a result, the court holds that section three of the 14th Amendment does not apply to Trump. And then she ordered Jenna Griswold, the secretary of state who was in the clip of Jen Psaki, to put him back on the ballot. Folks, this is madness. It's just madness. And this is, I, again, I'm not a scholar, but Lawrence Tribe is, a former a Harvard professor. He literally, literally wrote the textbook on American constitutional law. So he says, Judge Wallace held that anyone but a former president who did what she found Trump did, taking notes of the Constitution and then break that oath by engaging in violent insurrection, could never again run for any public office. So much for nobody being above the law. Nobody is above the law, apparently, except the president. And then Judge Ludig, who is a, a, a decades, like he, he, this man has been a conservative judge and constitutional scholar for decades. He's basically the right-wing version of Professor Tribe. He also finds the whole thing is ridiculous. Um, accepting the wholesale, wholesale the, the former president's tortured constitutional arguments, the court held that the presidency of the United States is not an office under the United States and that the former president was not an officer of the United States and did not take an oath to support the Constitution of the United States. It is unfathomable as a matter of constitutional interpretation that the presidency of the United States is not an office un under the United States. It's even more constitutionally unfathomable, if that's possible, that the former president did not take an oath to support the Constitution within the meaning of Section 3 when he took the presidential oath to preserve, protect, and defend. The Constitution is not a suicide pact with Amer America's democracy. Indeed, it's the very contrary in this instance, okay? This is, it, it, I, it's insane. It's absolute madness. But I'll conclude by saying this, that Citizens for Responsibility and Accountability uh, in Washington, okay, crew. They were one of the litigants in this particular case. They helped file the lawsuit. This is what they said. The court's decision affirms what our clients alleged in this lawsuit, that Donald Trump engaged in an insurrection based on his role in January 6th, said crew president Noah Bookbinder. We are proud to have brought this historic case, and we know we are right on the facts and right on the law. When we filed this case, we knew it likely would not end at the district court level. We will be filing an appeal to the Colorado Supreme Court shortly. Today was not the end of this effort, but another step along the way. So they plan to file uh, uh, an appeal. And this will likely make its way to the Colorado Supreme Court. And then again, we I would just be shocked if it never makes its way to the United States Supreme Court. I'd be shocked either in this case or in one of the others. So folks, again, I'm not a constitutional scholar. I'm not an attorney. I have a political science degree. I'm exceptionally well-read in politics, but I generally defer to the legal expertise of others. But even on its face, this logic seems tortured. The idea that we would hold grunts and relatively low-level officers, with all due respect to senators and congresspeople, to a higher standard than the single most powerful office in the country just runs completely contrary to the American ethic. And it also doesn't make sense from a threat prevention level. If, you're, if you find that these lower-level grunts, these lower-level officers are dangerous and therefore can't be trusted with positions of public office in the future, how on earth could you hold a position with infinitely greater power? How could you find that less dangerous and therefore not under the disqualification of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment? Again, it's not the end. There are other court cases as well. This one's going to be appealed. Let me know what you think in the comments. Sorry for taking so long, but this is profoundly important. This is the single most important constitutional question in modern U.S. history, and it will have a material impact on the 2024 election. Let me know what you think in the comments.